Um, so I think the first thing to say is that um, I was invited not to talk all about my particular bin, sanitary bin solution, but more about the whole way things could work for archaeologists. And the reason why I'm a little bit of a specialist on sanitary bins in archaeology is that about three years ago, we started to get orders in from a few archaeologists and I thought, oh, I can't remember the exact uh, route, but we ended up at a CIFA um, conference. So we've done, I think, two conferences so far. This year fell apart rather because it was going to be in April, wasn't it? So that's COVID done in. But um, that meant that I was talking more to archaeologists and understanding the issues that they're facing at the moment. And um, it's really quite specific. And because of, here we go, a new query. Oh, no, I'm just going to say this. Just please understand that my understanding of legislation is through working in the industry for the past 10 years. So I'm not a qualified waste manager. And if you if you want to get absolutely um, information related to your own specific situation, then the HSE with the workplace regulations is a very good place. And I've also uh, given you some information further on about the environment agencies and how they have got it together to make uh, your life and mine a lot easier. Um, so for archaeologists, the characteristics of your site control the complexities of providing sanitary bins in those locations. So you're often on remote locations, temporary locations, places where all I can say is it's very difficult to find you if you're a, uh, you know, if you're DHL and you're being told to go to a roundabout, take the third exit off and follow the link to a field three miles down the road sort of thing. So non postcode addresses. Um, and then you may be part of a complex construction site where you know your offices are part of a, a major site. Surprisingly, and over a period of time, you have, generally speaking, a larger percentage of women working um, in archaeology than you would have maybe in your um, group of, if you're on a construction site, they're mainly um, aimed at facilities for men and not for the large proportion of women in archaeology and as time goes by we all become aware that we need to be catering for all gender requirements so um, that's something that has not necessarily been considered in the legislation and it's certainly not talked about in the legislation because it talks about women and um, there's plenty of other uh, situations where sanitary bins of some kind are required. So if we look at initially there's two blocks of stuff I'm going to be talking about. One is about complying with the legislation, what you have to do in way of provision and what you have to do about disposing of the waste afterwards. So is it a legal requirement to provide sanitary bins? Do you have to have a sanitary bin waste collection service? In other words, do you have to contract with somebody to actually come to your site, find you, find your lose, um, and then uh, perhaps be escorted around site? Do you actually have to have that? Um, are you, um, is life made more complicated by having a special type of waste license? That's uh, certainly something that um, my customers generally have found that they're told that they need by um, a sort of uh, the service contract industry as it stands. What's the situation with the duty of care waste transfer note? We'll talk a bit about that. And is human hygiene waste hazardous, clinical or infectious? Which is something where we're really directed to think blood, oops, hazardous, clinical, infectious, nasty to deal with. And in reality, none of those things apply. Everything's um, much simpler and less um, difficult than you might think. Um, so looking at, let me just get this back. Sorry, I missed a slide. Um, so the requirement to provide sanitary bins is part of the workplace I've lost a word, Safety and Welfare Regulations 1992. 
and it's the second edition. It's the one that you can get from .gov very easily. And those regulations, which I'm sure you're aware of, that book comes in the regulations and then the guidance, regulation and guidance. So if you look at the actual regulations, which is the law bit, they don't specifically mention sanitary bins, but they do say that uh, they have this overall condition that says sanitary conveniences should be suitable and sufficient. And then in the accompanying approved code of practice, the interpretation of this is, this is where it's not too modern, it says in toilets used by women, suitable means for disposing of sanitary dressings should be provided. So I would say all toilets really need some sort of suitable means for disposing of dressing, sanitary or otherwise. But there we go. Um, And then it's interesting that also within those regulations, they talk about remote, temporary and construction sites. Whoops, spelling mistake there. Um, so in regulation three of the workplace regulations, number 25, it says that temporary work sites are also covered by these regulations where practical. So I think in the past, reasonably practicable, has not been easy if you're looking at trying to arrange a short term contract with somebody coming into the site, finding you swapping out the bins and replacing them. And that, I think, has been the difficulty for the archaeological world up until this point. Um, it's also about cost because the um, service contract people would rather you took out a year's contract and if you're just saying, well, actually, I need you to be coming here for three months, that's um, you know, it's, it's pretty diff difficult. I'd also mention that um, at the moment, my understanding is that a lot of archaeology sites are tied in quite closely with construction sites. And so the regulations are saying that construction sites, including site offices, are excluded for the regulations. But that's really where construction work is being done. So I would imagine that, although there might be some other regulations, if you're really integrated fully with the construction site, you might want to be reading um, the construction regulations as well. As far as I can see, so long as your archaeology unit is reasonably separate from the actual construction work, you're, you're really covered by um, regulations three and um, and the more detailed wording in um, Regulation 20 and 21. Anyway, it's all quite plain in there, um, which I think is helpful. Um, so they're talking about suitable for provision and what is suitable provision? Well, as long as you've got at the very least a pedal bin, uh, maybe a pedal bin with a liner, um, you're going to be okay. But really, I don't think that's very good staff welfare. And if you're a, if you're cleaning staff, then you've got to, um, you know, you've got to be emptying out the, the bag. And so you're starting to uh, put, put the onus on your cleaning staff to deal with, um, deal with the sanitary waste. So at the other end of the scale is the standard industry provision which is a service contract coming in and they take away the bins and give you clean ones um, that's fine if you're an office but again if you're difficult to find a long way from um, uh, built up areas then that's again impractical so in a way that's the reason why disposable bins are so good because effectively you can I mean, I'll describe with us, we send you the disposable bins out. Sorry to push this, but this is this is what one of our disposable bins looks like flat packed, if you can see that. So we send those out um, by couriers all over the country. And often we use Royal Mail, even for larger orders, simply because Royal Mail are better at finding places um, as their drive by than um, carriers because the carriers tend to be 
you know, point to point. Um, but that means that you can just put those bins into the uh, into your uh, your uh, stationary cupboard and bring them out as and when you need them. And they take a few moments to pop up, and then they sit there nicely. So they're in different colours as well. It all um, adds to the um, improvement in the sort of environment of the washrooms. So for our bin, then we're going to talk about how you are able to dispose of the waste. And just talking about sanitary bin contracts generally, there's such a lot of myths surrounding sanitary bins. So it'd be quite interesting if anything I've said to you today at the end, when you're asking questions, you're, you're going to say, well, I did not know that. Or, yeah, I thought that, you know, waste was clinical or hazardous. It'd be quite interesting to see if I am actually busting any myths here. Um, and in the last few years, since I started to push disposable sanitary bins, the environment agencies uh, of the devolved nations, so Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, have worked together and they've actually made it clear, very, very clear that, that only producers of significant amounts of hygiene waste, waste need a specific collection. Now, that's really good. Um, and I've given you a reference later on in the slides as to where that comes from. But what they say is significant in terms of amount is seven kilograms in any one waste collection cycle. So I think this is brilliantly clear, but also brilliantly practical because they don't know whether you're having your waste collected on a daily basis or a weekly or a monthly basis. They don't know whether you're having huge wheelie bins or small wheelie bins. So what they're giving us is a very practical guide as to one waste collection, no more than seven kilograms, which is about a black bag bin, bin bag full. Um, and the content of any sanitary bin, even one of ours full, is probably a kilo, one and a half kilos. So actually, you can um, dispose of quite a lot of waste in one waste collection. And the good thing also about um, disposing and managing your own waste that you'll only be emptying bins or changing over the bins when they're full and therefore it may only be that if you've got a half a dozen cubicles with bins in you're only going to be swapping out those one at a time so there's almost no business anywhere that's going to well very small proportion of businesses anywhere that ever going to come across uh, the seven kilogram limit on the waste collection cycle. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, and then the whole thing about hygiene waste into general business waste. We're talking about sort of black bag waste. Um, and it's made very clear by the Environment Agency's document, and it's called WMC3, Waste classification, the classification assessment of waste, technical guidance, whoops, goes on. But this is um, about a 200 page document which covers all sorts of practical problems with waste. And somewhere about page 160 or so, they start with some specific examples. Now, this is one thing that I raises my eyebrows and I find is really weird. And I don't think it would happen if we were writing this sort of legislation now is that feminine hygiene waste is lumped in this group of wastes called offensive wastes and I can only imagine that as time went by that it was convenient for the um, contractors in the industry of collecting feminine hygiene waste that it was called offensive wastes um, and to include hygiene, feminine hygiene waste in a group called offensive waste, I find extraordinary and slightly offensive. But there we go, that's what it's called. Uh, so when you're looking in WM3, you'll be looking for the example which covers offensive wastes. And so WM3 example four says that non-healthcare businesses like so not not anybody 
operating and clearing clinical waste, like householders, may dispose of small amounts and quantities of them in their mixed municipal black bag waste without it affecting the classification or management of that waste. So what they're saying is that this waste and all waste is controlled under waste codes, that black bag waste, which is 200301, can include some limited feminine hygiene waste without changing that waste code. So that means, for instance, that so far as your duty of care waste transfer notes are concerned, that if you manage your hygiene waste within those limits, you don't need a separate waste transfer note for this hygiene waste. Now, some contractors in the industry not only charge you for your contract for taking away the waste, but they may also be charging you for a separate waste transfer note for that hygiene waste. So once you go into the self-management side of things, you won't need that waste transfer note because it will be included in your waste transfer note for your, your general waste. So that must be one bit of um, messing about. But if you are on a contract, and this is another interesting point, and the supplier is charging you for this waste transfer note, which probably comes directly out of their computer for no work at all, you can actually manage this directly and free through um, a facility on .gov.uk and you can both raise and save your waste transfer notes for the um, legal time you're required and then it's uh, an easy place that you can um, store them and access them. And finally, um, you, if you're managing your own waste, you don't need a special waste license to manage your hygiene waste yourself. And um, and the sort of quantity that you're dealing with won't move you into having to um, have a special collection just for, for sanitary waste. So there I've covered as far as I can the um, as a summary of the regulations that are controlling the provision of sanitary bins and the sources for information about what you're allowed to do with that waste when you manage it yourself. Hopefully that will um, build some gaps in your knowledge or confirm it and uh, I'd re really like to take some questions. And it's a nice picture, isn't it? I will bring everyone in as panelists. And we've had one person who had to take off, but they've, so they said, thank you for the great presentation. Um, but they um, have to go to another webinar at 1230. They had a quick question sure. um, for you, uh, which was, as you had mentioned earlier, um, the site non-construction sites have slightly different regulations and stuff um, when it's you know a smaller amount of people, and it th their question was basically it didn't sound as um, cut and dry on what you do with say not a fenced off site. Um, basically, sometimes in archaeology we'll do watching briefs where we'll be out there with uh, two or three people, um, one of those being a digger driver, and they're, they're basically scraping back soil and attempting to see, you know, get an idea of what, what archaeology might be there. Um, their, their question was basically around what how can they ask for better provisions in those sort of situations where it's not cl as clear, it's not, you know, 25 people on a construction site? Right, so you're talking about you're just a small group of people inserted into the construction site, if um, you like. Not, part be, of probably pre, pre, before the main construction actually happens. Usually it's just two or three people out in a field doing a bit of pre-work before the construction even happens. Um, so that <laughs> the question was right. around there. 
Um, and I think the wording there comes under the impracticable, but that would be legislation. If I was being sent as a woman to any site, I would be expecting that I could go to the loo um, securely on that site. Um, and yeah, so I would be I would be expecting the construction people to be providing something because I mean, what do the blokes let's say the blokes my sexist just say maybe there's a woman driving the digger. Um, what would they what would they be, be providing for their own staff? So you're effectively subcontractors on that site. I think that construction, um, if you go to the uh, main workplace regulations they then you'll then be able to read the situation when you're on a construction site and how that applies so i don't know enough about it to be specific but it is covered and um it's fairly straightforward reading i think brilliant um in that case i will now turn over um to anyone else who, so everyone, you're now um, panelists. So if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, you can unmute yourself. Um, and there's a, a small enough amount of us. So just um, ask your question or make your comment whenever you feel like it. Hi, so um, Hi, Amy. But thank you thank you so much for doing this it's been incredible and really informative so it, 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 it's, it's, it's great to sort of you know li listen in and you know being part of this um I mean so I think I think my comment is that you know it's I think it's where brilliant Vince and seeing red could you know answer the whole practical questions for like the small groups like you know the individual watching briefs the tiny trench valuations and stuff because the employers should be providing you know, at least a seeing red pack which will have you know a disposable bag in it then at least you know it can be the waste can be removed them, um, by the individual off-site yes. um rather um yeah and to e even if there's no provision for welfare which there should be there aren't really any yeah there's no excuses on that one but you know on, on cases where where it's that you're just saying okay the employer is giving the individuals a seeing red pack to just you know at yep. least be able to help you know it's is it is it's one of those where i think employers just don't realize that there are practical alternatives out there mm -hmm. to you know um helping helping people on sites and I'm, I'm still getting over the comment on how female menstruation waste is seen as offensive i mean i'm not offended i know i know <laughs> glorious oh god so so yeah so that was sort of my my comment that i, I don't really have any questions i just thought it Great. So, thank you. Yeah. No. <laughs> I would actually say that I think that um, we're getting to the point where we may be thinking that um, managers and blokes who are dealing with this are going to be squeamish about it or difficult about it. But I think more it's simply that A, they haven't thought about it and B, OK, it's just like, right, fine, we'll just deal with it. Um, so it is less of a forbidden topic than it might have been in the past. So it's more about not thinking about it than um, not wanting to deal with it because that's a girl's thing, you know. Well, Susan, can you tell us a little bit about Brilliant Bends as well and the sort of products you have? And I believe, um, I could be wrong on this, but I think you had one specifically for port loos as well. No, um, we have we have one bin fits all, if you like. Um, ah. I could, so I've got a sample here that I could show you, uh, and I'll sort of I can turn the camera so it shows that, um, and sort of the features of it and why it's so straightforward. What I think about this is that um, quite a lot often it's the it's the employees themselves that may be ending up by not necessarily in archaeology the employees themselves might be ending up by dealing with these bins or that um, uh, that that might be a boss of a site or a boss of a business who gets doing these and nobody really wants to get involved in in 
feeling as though they've got a nasty job to do. So this really gets to the point where it's it's not a nasty job. It's just, hey, easy. Um, and for a kickoff, we when with the first of our bins, which I'm showing you is pink, right? Because when we when we first looked at designing the bins and we were thinking, you know, should they be roses? Should they be flowers? Should they be what? And then we finally decided that um, all the bins in in people's loos at the moment were grey and people were saying, well, it's got to be discreet. And I'm thinking, um, hold on a minute. It's in the ladies loo. Why does it have to be discreet? So anyway, we made it pink. And um, this, let me just see if I can turn this around. Right, so when we start off with this bin, which is flat packed, we send these out in boxes of four, sixes and twelve. So they just, you know, land up at the site. And when you pop them up, they have what I would call a posh carrier bin bag bottom, which just pops out. So, and then the top of it has a, if I can see it, yep, this wing comes up um, from the other side and they hold in place an inner flap and an outer flap and the outer flap's got a magnetic catch which keeps it down so it's it's really simple so then those there's some tabs that hold the the flaps in and the magnetic catch goes on the top there and and that's the whole process for putting the bin together um so that um when when the bin is used you've got this sort of inner flap so you can't see what's gone before that's the best way of describing it and on the back of the bin we've got some instructions for people who don't know what they're about um, a reminder that the waste code is just this general municipal waste code and um, one thing that's really important is this black as a black plastic sleeve sorry a plastic sleeve on the back with a black bin bag in so when this bin is ready for exchanging and you, you can tell that by just giving it a shake, it's really easy to feel. Um, you put the whole bin and the contents into the black bin bag. So that gets tied up and then put in your um, regular business waste. So the thing about that is you're not going to be having stuff falling out into your, to your general waste to be seen. Um, and yeah it is discreet except well absolutely it's discreet in in disposal but but it's cheerful in um cheerful in the loose and we we then decided that we were trying to make people decide two things at once one of which was oh shall we go disposable bins and oh do we have to go to pink so um uh, so we now have a purple one silver metallic mint which is rather nice and, and we also do a leopard print one which unfortunately I haven't got a sample here with me at the moment but it was just was just to make it more fun and then um, next year we've got plans to have a polished pill one and a sunflower one because they seem to be popular and cheerful cheerful colours and designs um, yeah and, and then these bins will sit there for two or three months some offices and churches have them sitting there for months and months and months as far as I can work out um, and you're only paying for what you need so you they arrive with you you pay for what you need when they need changing you swap them out you call us email us whatever order online and we ship the following day so there's not even a, a long lead time um, and it's really simple yep and you don't have to have um, contractors wandering around site either that you might need to um, authorize or uh, escort that's simple for archaeology that'd be quite helpful because on, on many construction sites as you might be aware of um, yeah getting people's permission to be able to have someone on site uh, if they don't have a CSCS card or something like that, it could be quite a quite an ordeal. So that's yeah, quite handy. Yeah, yeah. and um, there was one other thing that I was I found very interesting at the last CIFA conference. 
there was a very senior engineer in one of the big construction companies and she talked very enthusiastically rapidly shot off um into the distance and and she i don't think she wanted me to contact because she was just i'm off I've, i don't need you to contact me and i now know about you um and uh she said that what she says to the people on site the construction companies is look if you are going to um have women on site then either you are going to have to put more loose in or you are going to have to give the women longer breaks because they're getting to their um their toilets um, and they're having to queue so by the time they've finished the queue been to the loo their break is over and there's not a chance for a cup of tea or whatever and they need to eat in between so it was quite an interesting um comment about provision of cubicles generally for women on construction sites yeah, thanks. It's a huge huge problem and it's it's, it's something i think i flagged upon the last talk where it's just yeah, there, there is none, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, I just think there's such a movement these days to just demystify it and get on with it, and yeah, that was really good. Well done, Amy. Does anyone else have a comment or question? Hi, I'm Mel. I work for CFA Archaeology. I'm a fieldwork project manager, so um, I have to deal with all of this sort of stuff. And as a company, we we adopted the Seeing Red period packs um, about a year ago, probably now. And mm -hmm. um, and we provide um, uh, uh, the waste sanitary bins um, for site as well. So it's really for, for us, it's just a case of trying to normalise it amongst the staff, particularly the male staff who may feel a bit embarrassed about it, don't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, making sure that everything is available, accessible and uh, and and talking about it. So that, you know, yeah. that sense of embarrassment or reluctance disappears. Um, yeah. We, yeah. And we love the leopard skin ones, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh my God forgot to bring one of those down to uh, show you but yeah they're, they're yeah, very popular it's a bit wild um, yeah. <laughs> so actually the um the the regulations and whatnot that you put up on your slides earlier that that's all really helpful for us for to be able to explain um to staff this is why we're doing it this is why you have to do it and this is why we yeah. have to talk about it and not feel embarrassed yeah. and just get on with it you know yeah yeah um, yeah so yeah brilliant thank you and I, I sometimes think that if you if you actually compliment the people who do deal with it in a in a matter of fact manner, it goes goes a long way to to them feeling appreciated for getting on with it. So yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. Oh, great. Good. Well. As I say, um, if if anybody wants some free of charge samples sent to anybody, um, I'm quite happy to do that. Mm -hmm.